Scott. I am in the PC Support and Services, and today I'm going to talk about cryptocurrency. Now, cryptocurrency is a very large field, and we can go into a whole lot of detail, but that's not what we're going to do today. My three main goals today are to just help you gain a better understanding of what cryptocurrency is and how you can use it. The next goal would be give you kind of an overview and just an idea of what blockchain technology is. Because blockchain te technology is not used just in cryptocurrency. There are other uses for blockchain. And the third one, the opportunities for you as students and job interviews and what other things you could do with cryptocurrency. So in order to get an idea of cryptocurrency, I want to talk a little bit about the history of money. Okay, so the first one up here was, is fiat. Now fiat you may know as like a dollar bill. Okay, for example, something like this is fiat. It really doesn't have any value because it's just paper. But it is backed by the government or whatever government you are. Now there is a difference between a piece of paper like this, you know, or it's a hundred dollars, right? This is a hundred dollars, or this is a dollar. Which one is more valuable? Well, this is only valuable because we perceive it to have value. That's it. Okay? If you go back in time, people always exchanged goods and services for one thing or the other. Okay? Now we're using some type of currency. Now this is all, it says, all fiat, and fiat currency until 1971 was based on gold, the gold standard. Okay, so at Fort Knox, for every dollar we had in circulation, there was gold to represent that. And it's not exactly dollar for dollar, but basically gold backed dollar bill, that fiat currency. In 1971, we went off of that. And that allowed the government to print as much money as they want. So that led to inflation. So the more dollars that are out there, every dollar that we have is worth less. So now it costs more dollars to get the same goods and services. Ever since 1971, we went off the gold standard. The next form of money was our credit cards. So we use credit cards as like leverage. So we're spending money that we don't really have, but we're paying a premium for that. We pay a little bit more at the gas pump to pay by credit or cash in some places. You're borrowing from the future, meaning your money, you're paying interest on that money that you borrowed on that credit card. But we're so used to just swiping it, swiping it, and people are used to spending more money because it's a credit card. We don't see the dollar. It's harder to take a $20 bill out of your pocket and pay for something as opposed to swiping that credit card for 20 bucks. Credit cards are digital, right? There's no money that we see. The next thing is now crypto. Crypto is all digital. It's 100% digital. There are, it's software that builds this currency, and they have different use cases. It's anonymous, meaning there's an a alphanumeric code that is used for your wallet. And I can send currency, cryptocurrency, to your wallet. You can send it to somebody else's, and it all happens like that. When you use a credit card, if you're a business, you're going to pay somewhere like 2 to 3% of the transaction cost. With cryptocurrency, the fees are much lower and it happens much faster. Same thing with banking. If you're gonna wire money from your bank to another bank or a company, you pay a fee and it takes days. The more, the higher dollar value you send, the more you pay. With cryptocurrency, there's one fee, okay? And it varies time and distance and things of that sort. With our cryptocurrency, like I said, it's anonymous, it's digital, and we use software to create it. Here is just an example of software. The most common software used to create cryptocurrency, C++, Java, Python. There are others, 
But those are the most common ones. So when I talk about writing code, it's like adding to the blockchain. And here's an example of that. Remember I was talking about that code, like your wallet address, my wallet address, that alphanumeric code? This right here is an example all along here. And you see blocks and hashes. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But this is an example of how currency gets added to the blockchain. All the different cryptocurrency has different use cases. Some are the blockchain. Others add to the blockchain. Can I use my crypto to buy stuff? This is just a small sample of some of the companies that accept cryptocurrency. Microsoft, Overstock.com, Home Depot, Starbucks, Whole Foods, Newegg. Those of you that want to buy computers and computer parts, Newegg. Newegg got, had, will accept cryptocurrency. We have Bitcoin ATMs. They've had those for a long time. This is one that I saw recently. Took a picture of it so I could show everybody. You can go here, put fiat dollars in, and that will change into dollar, or those dollars will change into Bitcoin in this example. Now with Bitcoin, you don't have to buy a whole coin. Right now, one Bitcoin is about $37,000, $38,000. You might see stuff like this. This is not a real Bitcoin, so this is not worth $38,000. But people sell these. Right? And they look cool. And it looks like a gold coin. So you see this all over the place. So. Dallas Mavericks, Miami Dolphins, or other companies. These Bitcoin ATMs are all over the place. More and more companies every day are accepting some, point, some type of cryptocurrency. Bitcoin just happens to be the most popular. It's the one that most people know about. Uh, the second largest is Ethereum. Right? It's a, it has a different use case. It does different things. How does crypto relate to the blockchain? Right? So blockchain technology, like I was saying earlier, is not one blockchain. Right? We add to the blockchain over time. Now if we look here, crypto is built on the blockchain. There's more than one blockchain. Bitcoin is the most popular one. That's the one that people talk about and hear about. But blockchain technology can be used to store records, not just crypto. Blockchain, if you have a blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum, that's considered what we call a layer one technology. And then you can build other currency on that blockchain. And that will transfer from one place to another. And you have different wallets associated with those different blockchains. So the blockchain infrastructure is like a highway, a road, or like a railway system. So think of a train. And you have all the different cars behind the train. Each one of those trains, train, uh, trains is, um, cars is going to represent a block. And each of those train cars is connected to the bl uh, block or train car in front of it, right? They're chained together. As the engine moves along on the railway system, we keep adding tr one another car, another car, and they're all connected together. So if we take products and put them inside that railway car, we eventually fill up that car, right? And then we need to fill up the next car and the next car, but they're all connected. Same kind of thing with the blockchain. Instead of being a railway car, we take transactions that are recorded on a ledger, and that ledger eventually fills up just like that train car fills up. That is now uh, called a block. So that ledger fills up, we create a block. We chain that block to the next block just like a railway car is chained to the next car. And how that happens, we'll go over in just a second. 
So now I've got transactions go on a ledger. Ledger fills up a block. That block is chained to the next block. And then that block, same thing. Transactions, go into a ledger, fill up a block. That block creates the next block. Now, that's the beginning of our the infrastructure. So when you hear blockchain, think of infrastructure. Now I have other currencies that are built on that train. So what's going into those each of those railway cars or each of those blocks is other technology. It's other software. It's other currency. It's other documents that are put on them. Peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay, so the blockchain is what we call a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network. So if which is I'm gonna go talk about central banks, for example. So if I were a bank and I had all your money, you would all go through me for all your transactions. If I were a single blockchain and I kept all those transactions in ledgers and created the blocks and I had the only copy, then I could make changes to that. But with crypto and the blockchain being a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, now everybody in here has a copy of that block all over the world. It's not just stored in one place, it's stored everywhere. So we're all working together, we're all verifying the block, so that way one person cannot go and make a change on that block and the transaction and say, oh no, I have 500 Bitcoins, not 0.5 of a Bitcoin. Because then that's not gonna, what they call, reach consensus like an agreement where we all agree that yes, you do have 500 or no, you don't, it's only 0.5. So that's what makes it more secure. Cryptography is the term you're gonna hear talked about as far as securing the blockchain, which would be cryptography. Secured by cryptography, census, peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized. Okay, so that should make sense. So Bitcoin or a blockchain is not in one place. It's all over the place. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about that. So here's an example of like building the blockchain itself. Remember earlier I talked about the railway system and the train car and how each train car was connected to the next car. So here, with the blockchain, if you go back to the very, very beginning of Bitcoin, that first transaction recorded into a ledger, created a block, that block is still there. All the transactions that happened in that first block, in the very first, what they call the Genesis block, it's still there. It's still part of the blockchain. The blockchain continues to grow, gets larger and larger and larger over time. You'll notice here, a hash. So what happens is, it takes all the information inside that block and it creates a hash using an algorithm. That algorithm is called SHA-256. Okay? SHA-256 is what the Bitcoin blockchain uses to create this hash. So now that hash is recorded on that block. Now when the next block is created, or now it's that train car is connected to the next previous train car, you make the physical connection, that physical connection is this hash. So notice that this hash right here, previous block hash. So the next block, block one, refers to the Genesis blocks hash. This is that cryptography they were talking about. That secured part of it is right here. So now, this previous block's hash and all the transactions in this ledger are used to create the next hash for this block. And then that hash, which is here, is in the next block. And again, all the transactions in this block 
will then be created, right? We use that to create the next hash. And that process continues on. So if you've ever bought Bitcoin or moved Bitcoin from one wallet to another wallet, moved it around anywhere, those transactions are on the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, and then they're always gonna be there. And you're gonna see, it's not your name, your address per se, it's your crypto address, that alphanumeric wallet address. So if you buy currency from one exchange and you send it to another one, you have an address. And that address is for Bitcoin type of address or Ethereum type address. So if you have, let's say you have 10 different currencies, you would have 10 different crypto addresses. Because right? it's by blockchain. Each blockchain is different. Some are Ethereum based, some are Bitcoin based, and there are others out there. So this is how the blockchain works. Think of that train and adding all the train cars and have that connection. The hash from the previous block is recorded and used in the next block and so forth and so on. So they're chained together. That is the blockchain. And like I was saying earlier, blockchain is not just cryptocurrency. The blockchain, I mean, and cryptocurrency is what made the blockchain more popular. Blockchain technology can be used for all kinds of things, storing documents, mortgages, deeds of properties. So there's a lot more with blockchain technology that you'll hear more about over time. Now I would ask the question, how many people out there have bought any crypto? Has anybody in here bought crypto? My daughter bought some doggy, doggy coins. Doge coin. Doge coin. Doge coin. Doge coin. Yeah. So that, you know, yeah. So there's all sorts of ways to buy crypto, and I'm going to talk about that here in just a second. All right. But a lot of people have heard about crypto, uh, cryptocurrency now. You know, I heard about it years ago, and I thought, you know, I heard about it from a ransomware, where I saw that you had to uh, pay a, you know, fifty. Bitcoin or whatever it was, you know, to get your files and everything unencrypted. Um, so I didn't really know much about it. And then over time I learned more. Now I've been involved in learning and, and I in purchasing and doing other things with cryptocurrency for the last three plus years now. So I'm not an expert. Um, I have experience. I've watched hundreds of hours of videos and read lots of stuff about cryptocurrency because I think it's interesting. You know, being in IT, it's just an area that, that, that I'm just interested in stuff like that. So, blockchain. So up at the top here, transactions or records, they go into that ledger, that ledger fills up, creates a block. Block fills up, mine. So, in the beginning with Bitcoin, you could, you would have a program and you could have it on a PC and run these mathematical algorithms that create a hash. And you're verifying information on the blockchain through an algorithm, and that was called mining. You hear people say, I'm mining Bitcoin, I'm mining Ethereum, I'm mining this currency, that currency, whatever. So you would use, nowadays, you use GPUs, so your graphics cards can mine, for example, Ethereum. You can't really mine Bitcoin on a PC or a graphics card anymore because there are, the blockchain has gotten so large and there are so many companies that have gone out and purchased what they call these ASIC miners. An ASIC miner just does one thing. It mines Bitcoin or it mines Ethereum or there's others as well. And they've got hundreds, if not thousands of them. So for us at home, the only way to mine Bitcoin now, well, the main way, would be to buy ASIC miner. And they're very expensive. You could also mine other coins and then use the money from that coin to, 
For example, you could mine Ethereum and then use that Ethereum to convert to Bitcoin. And there's address and stuff, so you're using one to buy the other. That's the mine part. The hashing algorithm, that's what's used to mine and create these hash and verify the information in each of these blocks. And it's a competition because there's people all over that are mining whatever currency and whoever solves the riddle, so to speak, who gets the answer, that they share in the rewards. And what you kind of do is you kind of pool people together and you join something called a mining pool and then that mining pool distributes the money or in this case, currency. So whatever currency you're mining, you're getting a reward based on all the people in that pool. There's a lot to it. I know, I know. Real, real quick though, and yes. I'm gonna throw you off that. Yeah. So when, when I hear the term mining, I'm thinking about four Ks. In the old days, guys go over and buy a piece of land. Yeah, there's no pick and a shovel. No pick and a shovel. Yeah, no, no pick and no. shovel. So they're actually just looking for value. Looking, value. So these these blocks mm -hmm. and stuff here. So if you're using, for example, if you're using, so nowadays what most people, I hear people talk about mining, most people are mining Ethereum right now because you buy a graphics card, you know, and these graphics cards, you take advantage of the memory and processing capability of that graphics card, and then you install a, a program, and that program utilizes your graphics card to run applications on it and try to get a share and then solve that equation using these algorithms and then you you get Ethereum based on that. You know, so people, once people with the best resources for, for mining have the better chance of Yes. That's why we do things called pool mining. So people join let's say you have four graphics cards you're not going to try to mine by yourself. You're going to join a mining pool. So other people that have four, six, eight, ten, two, one graphics card all are working together. And then everybody gets a share of that block reward. So mining is a whole other area. Um, mining requires knowledge of PCs, like, you know, starting from a motherboard, the processor, the RAM, the graphics cards, and how to connect it, and then understanding power, and how do you power up everything. Um, why is Ethereum right now the most popular one of uh, One, because of the price of Ethereum. Uh, right now, the price of Ethereum is somewhere around $2,700, $2,800. Yeah, for one Ethereum. So, um, and the graphics cards that we have today, it's just more efficient to mine Ethereum. And there are other ones that are pretty efficient, but sometimes miners, they mine a particular coin, they call it speculative mining, thinking that I'm gonna mine this coin now because nobody else is really doing it. Uh, and I'm hoping that a few years down the road that this technology is going to take off and the value of this particular coin is going to go way up. There was a time when Bitcoin was a dollar. Same thing with Ethereum. I remember Ethereum being you know, way under $100, 50 bucks, you know, now it's $2,800. Over time, cryptocurrency has gone up. A lot of people are afraid of cryptocurrency because they see these spikes. Like today, it's way down. So is the stock market. Everything's down today. But if you look at it over time, it's gone up much higher percentages than anything else. And more and more countries and companies are utilizing cryptocurrency and adopting cryptocurrency. So all of that is contributing to it. All right, so that's kind of like a little offshoot with talking about like the mining parts of that. So blockchain, the key thing to remember is 
you, a block is created, it has a hash, okay? If SHA-256, for example, for blockchain for Bitcoin, right? And that hash is referenced in the next block, and in the next block, and the next block, and so on, so on. And this is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. So if we had 100 people in here, we would all have a copy of it. So one or two people or three people can't get together and make changes because, you know, here's another thing. If you try to change something on this block, that hash changes. And now the, the link is broken. So you have to change this one too. Well, then it changes the hash here. So now the hash is, the link is broken again. So you have to keep going back. And remember, the very first block is still part of the blockchain. So who knows how many links we have in the chain. All right, so if you were gonna look for cryptocurrency and try to learn more about how much a particular coin is or do what we call do your own research on a particular coin, there's a couple sites here that I've posted. This is the first one, CoinMarketCap. You go into CoinMarketCap and it shows you a list of currencies and tokens, coins. You, know, you can hear all those terms used. There are thousands of them. The most popular ones, the ones at the top have the most value. They, they've been around longer, they have more trading volume, they're larger coins. Now, one of the big differences between going back to the fiat, okay, since we were off the gold standard and we can print as many dollars as we want, with crypto, you'll see on here, let's see if this one shows it. Um, it was probably further over. But it, with cryptocurrency, for example, Bitcoin, there can, it's written in the code that there can never be more than 21 million. They can't go back and rewrite something, so we're gonna make it 31 or 41. They can't do that. It's 21 million is the most. Once it gets to 21 million, that's it. So one of the big reasons why Bitcoin keeps going up in value is because there are less of them. There's somewhere around 17 to 19 million Bitcoin have been created so far. So these, every time, going back to the previous slide, so when these blocks are, are they've reached consensus, consensus, right? They've agreed upon and you've been given a block reward. And that's where new Bitcoin is created. And something that happens over time is something called a halving. So that block reward gets cut in half every four years. So that helps to reduce inflation. The price of the coins go up because the total number of coins is scarce. And so anytime you have lesser of something, people are willing to pay more for it. <clears throat> so this is one place where you would go to to learn more about different coins. You can click on each one of these You've got the market value, the market cap, right? uh, the turnover, and you can buy and sell cryptocurrency 24-7. It never stops. You can go in at 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning and buy crypto or sell crypto or transfer from one location to another. There are so many people in the world that do not have a bank account. They refer to them as like unbanked. Right, so, but what do they have? They have cell phones. They don't have a bank, but they got a cell phone. You can do all of this on a cell phone. And I'm gonna show you some other stuff here in just a second. So coin market cap, and here's another one that I use, uh, coin gecko. You can sort all different ways in here. You can go and search by categories, you can look at how much volume you can look at the market cap over here this right now is seven days what it's looked like as far as up and down of it you can look at long-term 
I, I look at it all long term. Some people like to trade it. I, I don't really trade it. It takes take too much time. I buy it. I understand the technology. I read. So when you go in, for example, Cardano, okay, you click on that. The next page, you can go and read what they call a white paper. The white paper is like the outlay. Like this is our plan. These are the goals. This is what we want to accomplish over time. And you can read through that white paper and say, yeah, I, I like this. I see what they're doing. And you can watch videos of multiple people talking about it. And then you can make a decision what you want to do at that point. Right? And you can do that with any of these. Some are more popular than others. Some of them, some of these coins a year ago weren't even in the top 100 and now they're in the top 20. But number one and two have been one and two for at least the last three and a half years, or three plus years, however long I've been looking at this stuff. <clears throat> now, once you've done research and you figure out, okay, this is interesting, I might like to buy some. First thing you gotta know is you don't have to buy one Bitcoin. You can buy a portion of a Bitcoin. You can say, all right, I want to, for example, with Coinbase, which is a centralized exchange. Centralized means you create an account, you set up your bank account to send money to Coinbase. And then once your money is on Coinbase, you can use that to purchase whatever you want to buy. For example, you can send $100 and you say, I want to buy $100 in Bitcoin. And you can do that. You can also set up something called dollar cost averaging. You can say, all right, I want to buy $100 a month every month and put it in Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever one you decide to. If you're using Coinbase, they've got a hundred and something that they have on their site, uh, probably more. And you can set up a dollar cost averaging for that. And you don't have to buy a whole coin. You can buy whatever fraction you want, or as much, uh, the dollar amount that you want. Crypto.com is another one that I use. You may have seen some of their commercials. Uh, these companies are getting, well, Coinbase is listed on NASDAQ. You can buy stock in Coinbase. Uh, Crypto.com, uh, you probably saw some of their Super Bowl commercials. LeBron James, uh, Matt Damon, we're in some of the Crypto.com. And BlockFi is another one. I, I, I use all, all of these. I have apps on my phone for all of them. Right? You can buy and sell, send money from one to another, all from your phone. That's what's so attractive to the people around the world that don't have a bank account. They can do this. Use these apps. All you gotta do is get money there. You can wire money. There are, there are various ways you can get money to these accounts. You know, it doesn't have, we're, we have the advantage. If you have an account, you just set it up and send money anytime you want. I can go on my phone right now and send money to any one of these and buy something or I could sell something all right so there are lots this is just three this is just three that I use there are a lot more of centralized exchanges the other part so you have centralized where you send money to them and they purchase it and they hold your currency there you could then send it from your wallet at Coinbase, Crypto.com, BlockFi, you could send it from that wallet to a software wallet on your phone or a hardware wallet. A hardware wallet would be like a thumb drive. It's not really a thumb drive, but it's like a thumb drive. And you would send it to that thumb drive and that's your crypto. If you lose it, you lose your crypto. That's why most people just leave it on the exchanges because they trust that it's still going to be there. As I said, Coinbase is listed on NASDAQ. These are larger companies. So the opposite of a centralized exchange would be a decentralized exchange. So here we look at some advantages and disadvantages. So a centralized exchange 
The exchange controls your funds. It's not anonymous. They know who you are, they have your social security number, your address, and everything about you. Hacks and server downtime. People can hack into them. They can get into one of those machines. It doesn't happen often, fortunately, but it can happen. Whereas decentralized, us, the user, we control everything. It's anonymous. Right? Something called MetaMask, Uniswap. These are wallets that you could add to your browser and that's for no information. You just send whatever currency to that wallet and then you can use that wallet and that currency to buy other things on the internet. No hacks or server downtime. Right? You can put these decentralized wallets on your phone as well. With a centralized exchange, they're easy to use. And this is where most people get their start. Uh, has advanced tools. You can look at you know, charts and graphs and lots of information. There's learning modules. I know with Coinbase, they have all kinds of videos you can watch and learn about currencies. I did that for a long time. I still do it. Liquidity. So what they mean by liquidity is that let's say you wanted to buy five Bitcoin. Okay? Just came in a bunch of money, I want to buy five Bitcoin. It's easy to do it on Coinbase. They have liquidity. They have Bitcoin. They have it there. They got whatever coins you want, they have them there. Whereas decentralized, this is not easy to use. You kind of have to figure things out on your own. You can watch some videos and learn, but this is not as easy to use. Very, very basic features. You know, it's basically just a wallet. You, you, you have to know what you're doing uh, to use these decentralized. Low liquidity. So you might not always get the best price. Because you're trading with somebody else that's trying to do the opposite of what you're doing. All right, so that's centralized and decentralized. Advantages and disadvantages. Most people start centralized with some of the examples I gave you earlier. All right, what type of jobs can you get? Well, PC system maintenance and repair. So earlier I was talking about mining. If you're mining Bitcoin, Ethereum, or whatever currency, and you can work for a company, you're going to be setting up hardware. Right? All the hardware. You're going to maintain that hardware. You're going to look at uh, ventilation. You're going to look at installing whatever algorithms you need on there. Uh, connecting it to the network. Uh, connecting to the internet. Routers, switches come into play when you're talking about setting up your system's architecture. You know, this room could be set up to mine cryptocurrency. Problem with this room is ventilation. You have th these machines generate a lot of heat. Whether they're graphics cards or ASIC miners, they generate a lot of heat. So you have to have a way to get the heat out of the room. So these windows, if these windows opened, or you could put a, a fan in there to suck the heat out, you could utilize this system here to suck heat out as well. And if you're working in that business, those are some of the things that you would do as far as system architecture, PC systems, maintenance, repair type stuff. Uh, software development, like earlier I was saying, Python, C++, Java. You could write code, you could contribute to different aspects of what these different cryptocurrencies are doing, their, their particular use case, like what are they trying to accomplish? Because they have a roadmap. Like earlier I mentioned like Cardano, you go look at their white paper and you look at their roadmap. They have a team of software developers that are developing and working on that roadmap so they can get to from point A to wherever they want to go to. Right? So that's software. Automation, systems, factory, fabrication, design, 3D printing. These are all different areas you can get into. Now, money. Everybody's going to say, what kind of money can you make? And how do you find out with these companies? So go, earlier I showed you uh, CoinMarketCap and CoinGecko. If you go to those websites and you click on, a, for example, Coinbase, right? you click on Coinbase, 
You can go to their website and you can look at careers and job openings. They are all, these companies are always looking for people. That's how you find the companies. You click on, look for exchanges. Now in there, as far as these type of jobs and what they're looking for, they want to know, not all of them require a four year degree and not all of them require two years. They want to know what experience you have, your willingness to work, and how, what, what have you done that may pertain to what you're applying for. And they have jobs that are not just IT related, obviously, they have other ones as well. The IT jobs, these jobs right here, and one similar, you could start out making in the 50s, and as you gain experience, you get up to 100, 150,000 or, or more a year, depending on how good you are and what you're doing. The software development side, uh, those programmers, the higher programmers with, a, with more experience, they're gonna make that $100,000, $150,000 a year. A lot of these jobs are remote. So you might be working on a laptop wherever you want to be. Live where you want to live. There are some jobs that are obviously at the building, but a lot of them are not. So these are the opportunities out there. A lot of opportunity in crypto. All right, so that is the end of the presentation for today. Uh, questions? Are there any questions like on the chat? I can ask you some other. Okay, I just saw you. Yeah. Okay. You guys have any other questions? No? How long does it take for a new form of cryptocurrency to pick up typically? Oh, Ooh, that's hard to say. That's a good question, but that's, that's hard to say. It, it, I would say it would depend on one marketing and use case. What what is this going to do? What is it going to solve? Uh, there's one called Chainlink, which basically provides a link, like the name Chainlink. It provides a link between like blockchain and like um, documents, like to go into the blockchain transaction wise stuff. So it really depends on use case marketing. You know, how well they promote what they're going to do. And then it's association. Like, what other currencies support you? What are the currencies are you working with? And all of that information would be in the white paper initially, and then it would be on their website. So when you go to a website, you're going to look at if it's a really good website and they've got associations with like major other currencies uh, that are they're involved with because a lot of times they work together and they help out and then you also want to look at you know who's putting this currency together or what's the use case and um, is it a blockchain or is it a currency is it a token what is it and who's behind it there are people from you, you think of any of these major technology companies there are people that used to work and spent years in that field who are now in crypto and developing cryptocurrencies. So if you look at, oh, this guy worked at you know, Apple, and, you know, and this, there's another guy, there's two guys from Apple, for example, that left Apple to work on this cryptocurrency project with a couple other people, let's say, that have crypto experience from working with, let's say, Ethereum. So those are kind of things that, that people look at to try to decide whether they want to invest in. Anything? Another question. Okay. People say that uh, cryptocurrency, I mean, like, it's believed to be like something that a lot of like criminals use, or like in media it said like it's hard to track, or like impossible to track. Is it really like that difficult to pinpoint where funds are going and where they're circulating to well, and from? Well, you can. Find, you can go, there are places you can go on the internet, there are websites that will track by your address. So you can see, like I could go in and see the, every transaction you look, by looking up my wallet address. It doesn't say that's Mark Scott, it just says this wallet address. So can somebody find that wallet address? Sooner or later, I guess they probably can figure that out. Um, it's not easy, 
um, but it's all by the wallet address. And that's an alphanumeric code. It it's really identifies you. But every transaction is recorded, and you can see every transaction. So as far as criminals using it, um, there was a project years ago. Uh, I say mm, I not know exactly the date. I would say within the last, I'd say about eight years ago, maybe. Um, I could be wrong. I'm not an expert. Uh, there was something called Silk Road, where you people would go in. It was in like the dark web, and you could go in and buy illegal things there. Now, is crypto used in criminals? Probably. But what's used more? Fiat dollar bills or hundred dollar bills. There's, it's just easier and people have used, been using that for a long time. Some people just like the cash. So. It's, like it's harder to track cash. It can be. Yeah. It can be. But, um, but then the problem with that is if I'm going to pay you a million dollars in cash, I got to get it from somewhere. You know, I just don't have it in my mattress. You know, I got to go to the different banks and maybe pull out money from different banks and, and I, I have to physically give it to you. Does the government actually track a certain portion of, uh, of uh, cryptocurrency or, or try to? Not that I'm aware of. Um, like I said, everything is recorded in the blockchain, but as far as it, you know, government involved in that, I mean, they have the same access as you and I. I mean, we could all go and see but again, it's just the wall adder. So you could look at what I would think is like if you see hundreds of Bitcoin being moved around, you know that might be something I don't want to look at. You know, you can track all that stuff. Earlier, you referenced videos that helped you get into it. Do you have any recommendations for where to start? Um, I would just do a search because it depends on what you're looking for. Um, just go into YouTube and, and search on whatever topic you're interested in, and you'll see all kinds of videos of that. I mean, you could spend days, hours, months, years going through all the information that's available out there on cryptocurrency. And more and more people uh, are getting into it, so they're, like, I, I can think of some of the YouTubers that I've been following for years when they had like 3,000 followers and now they've got like 100,000 followers. Just Well, is there any particular channel that you'd recommend? Um, I don't really want to recommend any one channel. Um, yeah. No. It's being recorded, so. Yeah, I, I don't want to get it. <laughs> um, one thing is countries were to go to big uh, cryptocurrency, what would happen if it was like an emergency? You couldn't have a run on the, on the bank or on the, um, or on the um, re re repository, you know? I mean, how would people feel like they, they you know, people panic, they go, I need to get my money back or my crypto coin back. There yeah. couldn't be a run on, on the bank or anything. It, it, no, it, it, it's easier. It's easier, and it, because remember, crypto is throughout the entire world. Um, as opposed to like if, Let's say we had all of our money in the bank and the banking system failed or the government seized all the money in our bank accounts, it's gone. But they can't seize what's in your crypto wallet. So that's, why, that's one of the things that some people have been attracted to is because of that. But going back to what you alluded to with people all around the world, if they don't have a bank or don't have access to a bank, but they have a phone, it, it just makes things so much easier. And so like, if I was gonna go to say France, once I'm there, I gotta exchange my dollars for the fiat currency in France. There's an exchange rate and there's a fee I gotta pay and then whatever I have left, I've gotta exchange it back to dollars. Or if I wanted to buy something that was in that currency, but with cryptocurrency, I don't have to do that. I could just send, let's say they'll, they'll take, um, like you mentioned, uh, let's just say Ethereum, right? They take Ethereum, I could just send them Ethereum, done. I could go to 
um, another country, and if they're accepting various cryptocurrencies, I can just use that. I don't have to exchange it for anything. But one of the things with Bitcoin, they everybody looks at Bitcoin as a store of value. Um, you might hear the term digital gold. Uh, so like most people who've been around in crypto for a long time, with Bitcoin, you buy it and you hold it. I don't plan on selling any Bitcoin that I've got anytime soon. Um, you look at all kinds of predictions out there on the price and what it's going to be at some point, what people believe it's going to be. You know, If it goes anywhere close to that, I'll be a happy man. And so will anybody else. Is there any circumstance in which uh, any of these types of currencies would have massive spikes of either increasing or decreasing value? That does happen. That does happen. Um, just today, uh, I think, I don't know exactly, but I think Bitcoin probably went down you know, 1500 or $2,000 from yesterday. Um, so it went from 39 something to 37 something. Is that because of what, what the interest That's, rate affected? Um, well, so yesterday when the Fed announced the half point increase, mm -hmm. the stock market and currency, cryptocurrency prices went up. And then today, it all went down. It fluctuates. So I look at investing as long term. Some people like to day trade it or swing trade it. Um, that's up to them. But I look at buy, hold it for the long term. And yes, there will be times when Bitcoin was, I, I remember when Bitcoin was $3,000 and I remember when Bitcoin was 68000 So it goes up and down. But over time, it's gone up. And I said, at one point it was a dollar. It was less than a dollar. And you could mine Bitcoin on a computer and you get you know, hundreds of them. But I remember when you mentioned about drastic changes, well, when I was working Spectrum, I started there in 88. In 2008, you know, with a housing market, nose dive. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was drastic. I mean, oh, yeah. I lost some money, you know. But, yeah, but long term, they have out. But it's, right. But, but Bitcoin, Real estate. Like Real estate, and now real estate is business. You can't buy a house now. Yeah, I mean, if you go back to the maybe 2004, five, and you bought something, and then it went way up in 2008, nine, and then it plummeted way down, and then over time it steadily came back up, and it just took off again. You know, so that's where we are now. But over time, from going back to point A, what real estate was, and where it is today, where will it be five years from now? It could be less than it is now, but over time, it's still gone up steadily. Well, I'm thinking that after people that the people that have been in long term, they pretty much well, I don't know if they say that cap, they they made all they made the majority of the money. Oh yeah, uh, the, uh, the there are, are the there's there are, there's quite a few documentaries out there on Bitcoin and tracing people where they started early on with Bitcoin and they probably have a hundred, they've got probably thousands of Bitcoin. And they refer to them as whales. Uh, and there's a, there are a lot of really young people involved in cryptocurrency and mining and all that stuff. So they, 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 they are excited about the technology and long term making money. Is it possible if there is any type of if there's any type of catastrophic scenario on like the 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 technical side of it? Could there is there any currency that all of a sudden could just be rendered worthless? That's always a possibility. Yeah, I mean with anything, I mean companies can go bankrupt. Currencies, it's happened. There's many currencies that are no longer around. Um, and five years from now, some of the ones that are on the list may not be around. It may have been replaced by something better. Um, Bitcoin has been the, was the first one, and 
it, it's still there, and people believe that it will be around for a long, long time. There are more and more investment companies getting involved in, uh, and like hedge funds that are buying crypto and holding it. Most of them are buying like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a, a, and a few others, but they're putting it in their portfolios. You can buy Bitcoin in your IRA now, and you have been able to for a few years now. And more and more regulations, like you gotta pay taxes on it, your gains, so if you're mining cryptocurrency, you have to pay taxes on what you mine. So regulation, so that people know the guidelines, helps these financial institutions so they know, okay, this is, I, this is the process I need to follow. All right, I think we've come to the end of our time here today. So thanks everybody for attending. And y'all enjoy the time, get out there, do your own research, find out about cryptocurrency if it's something that interests you, and enjoy it. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.